I'm delighted and privileged to introduce this important film on a lecture being given by Sir Peter Macefield. Sir Peter is speaking about the work of the Brabazon committees during the war years. Sir Peter speaks from personal experience with the work of the Brabazon committees as he was in fact their liaison officer and subsequently when he was with British European Airways was responsible for the introduction of the very successful Viscount aircraft, one of the great successes emerging from the Brabazon Committee. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Past President, Mr. Vice President, Director, old friends, which include all of you, of course, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about transport this evening, and I can't help remembering that the first mention of transport was in the Bible. I think the first book of Kings, chapter 13, verse 13, where Jeremiah Jeroboam said, saddle me an ass, and they saddled him. <laughs> and we've all been in that position ever since. Now, may I start by saying what a pleasure it is to be in these familiar surroundings with the Society's historical group and see so many old friends here this evening. And I must say how delighted I've always been that this group came into being during my presidential year, 59 and 60. And no less that all those years ago, the great pioneer and leader of British aviation, Sir Thomas Sopwith, old friend of many years, agreed to deliver our inaugural lecture to this group on his early days in aviation, starting with ballooning in 1906 and going on to teach himself to fly at Brooklands. And I think this is where we come on to the suitable slide. Teaching himself to fly at Brooklands, sitting out in the open on the lower wing of a Howard Wright pusher biplane. And then eight years ago, we had the pleasure of celebrating his 100th birthday in proper aeronautical surroundings of Brooklands. Now, this evening, Mr. Chairman, you've kindly invited me to follow in Sir Thomas's footsteps, or slipstream, should I say, and speak of one of the many great outstanding contributions to aviation history of that other great pioneer and advocate of British aviation, the late, the Right Honourable, the Lord Brabazon of Tara, always Ivon to his family, and affectionately just brab to his legion of friends. He was, as you know, the highly esteemed chairman of the two successive Brabazon committees of 1942 to 1945, set up to attempt to foresee and recommend a series of British transport aircraft to be available for service <coughs> after the war. And I had the good fortune to be fairly closely involved with Brab and with his two committees well, pretty well all the way through. And Mr. Chairman, you know, as the centenary comes closer of man's first powered and controlled and sustained flight at Kitty Hawk, we of the Royal Aeronautical Society recall how many and how complex and how varied, as well as historic, have been the succession of events which have flowed through aviation history and in recent years through this very hall here. Now few of them, of those events, have been more complex or more varied than those which made up and came from the first four years of deliberations of the committees under Lord Brabazon. More than 70 of the, 70 of the top people of not just aviation but Britain of that time were directly involved in one way or another and they started with the Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And the committee's work brought valuable employment after the war to a fair number of, of Britain's aircraft and aero engine companies and their suppliers. Indeed, I think it's fair to say that the Brabazon committees laid the foundations of British post-war civil aircraft design, which lasts on to this day. So right at the start, let's plunge in and see what, in quite basic and simple terms, 
the Brabazon committees achieved. Here's, in very brief form, what one can say, and that's 1,244 new British civil transport aircraft came directly out of the Brabazon Committee's recommendations. And of them, 1,170 Brabazon aircraft went into airline service, while 829 new British aircraft were exported, mostly to airline operating companies overseas. Those are really the bare bones of the story. So I could stop there and leave it to you. Of course, it wasn't really as simple as that. There were four packed, still wartime years of debate, discussions and endeavour in which to weigh up and sort out the many possibilities and options amid a whole confusion of pros and cons. And all the time, the committees were attempting to peer ahead into the fast-moving technology of those days, as of today, while the future of this civilised world was still in the balance at that time. Now, with limitations on time, for a talk which could really go on for several hours, I won't do that, it, may I say it all began way back in 1937, when the Cadman Committee of Inquiry into British Civil Aviation was set up to explore why Britain was falling behind in the design and construction of transport aircraft and their operations, and what to do about it. And here you see the list of the Cadman and three subsequent committees which led the way towards the first Brabazon Committee. I'll do more than just note the existence of those bodies which led the way, except to say that of them, an important and secret Special Advisory Committee of the Royal Aeronautical Society was set up in July 1941 by the then Minister of Aircraft Production to advise him personally and confidentially at monthly lunchtime meetings. Brad was always keen to combine the flesh pots with serious work on a wide range of wartime issues which concerned the whole field of British aviation. And that Minister of Aircraft Production was Lieutenant Colonel JTC Moore Brabazon, and there's Brab at the time he was Minister of Aircraft Production. And as you know, no one had been longer or more, or more closely associated with British aviation than had Moore Brabazon. Past President of the Royal Aeronautical Society from 1934 to 46, a member of the Royal Aero Club since 1902, when at only 18 he joined as a practicing balloonist to become chairman 20 years later. Brab had learned to fly at Chalon in France in 1907. He was the proud holder of the Royal Aero Club's Balloon Aeronautic Certificate No. 8 of 5th of November 1907. He always said it was appropriate that 5th of November sent him up in a balloon. And even more of it, he was even more proud of it, Aviation, Aviator's Certificate No. 1 of 8th of March 1908. And let's remind ourselves that Lord Brabazon's links with aviation after ballooning go right back to the Wright brothers. Brab with Charlie Rowles and Griffith Brewer were hosts to the Wrights in May of 1909 when they came to this country to receive a council, at a council dinner, the first gold medal of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and next day to be driven down to the Royal Aero Club's flying ground at Laysdown by Charlie Rolls and Brab in the original Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. And here we see them in front of Muscle Manor of those days. Brab there on the, with Orville Wright on his left, um, Wilbur Wright on his left, Orville Wright here, and Charlie Rolls there with Griffith Brewer, who was their great friend and brought them to England, behind. And that links Brab with those very first beginnings of powered flight. During the First World War, as a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Flying Corps, he won the Military Cross and pioneered photographic air reconnaissance. And after the war, as MP for the Chatham Division of Rochester, the seaplane manufacturing base, of course, of the Short Brothers, he was from 1919 to 1921, Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Secretary of State for War and Air, the Right Honourable Winston Churchill, and that was a very important early link. Now, throughout the 
between the war years, 1919 to 39, Brad was closely in touch with almost every aspect of British aviation. Now, on the 1st of May, 41, Lord Breverbrook, the first Minister of Aircraft Production, became Minister of State with special responsibilities from the Prime Minister, and Winston Churchill named his old friend, Moore Brabazon, to succeed Beaverbrook as the second Minister of Aircraft Production for a stint of nine and a half months, from 1st of May, 1941, to 2nd of February, 42. And on the 14th of March of 42, Brab was raised to the peerage as, Braben, as Baron Brabazon of Tara, which was his family's ancestral home in County Meath, and he added Andoff Sandwich, his favorite golf course. <laughs> Brab never neglected his sporting interests any more did he, than he did his aviation responsibilities. Now, early in that time, as Minister of Aircraft Production, Brab appointed as his special scientific advisor a great man, as his, Sir Henry Tizard, chairman of the Aeronautical Research Council and a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society since 1917, and chairman of the Society's Council in 1924 to 25. In discussion with Tizard, Brab decided that he would greatly benefit by seeking straight and wholly personal advice from his old associates of the Society, those who were in the aircraft industry. So, though this unorthodox approach was not particularly enthusiastically received by his civil servants, Brab appointed a minister's advisory committee of selected senior technical mem members of the aircraft industry and of this society under the chairmanship of Roy Fedden. From left to right, there's Pritchard, who was secretary, uh, Frank Holford of de Havilland and Napier Engines, Roy Fedden, who was chairman of the committee, Brab himself, Arthur Gouge of Shorts, and Charles Walker of de Havilland's. And that was the original advisory committee and, in fact, the genesis of the first Brabazon committee. Later on, Sidney Cam, Ernest Hives, Rex Pearson, Roy Chadwick, Thomas Barlow, and Leslie Aitchison were added to the committee. And it served five successive ministers of aircraft production right to the end of the war. And when opportunity occurred, Brab emphasized to the Prime Minister the value of this strictly personal advisory committee. So when with increasing emphasis, the parlous state of the lack of any plans for, for, future, for future British civil transport aircraft became obvious, in stark contrast with the United States, the Prime Minister's thoughts began to turn to the possibilities of another line of responsible and informed advice on what, what might be done to promote, to promote civil transport aircraft without injury to the war effort. The need to action was specially brought home to Churchill by two Spartan in flights to Moscow and, and Cairo and back in August of 42, perforce made in an American airplane, a, a Liberator, an unheated seven semi-converted bomber and of course unpressurized. And as a result of those hazardous and uncomfortable flights, after consulting with Sir Archibald Sinclair, Sinclair, Secretary of State for Air, and with the newly appointed third Minister of Aircraft Production, Sir Stafford Cripps, from 22nd of November 1942, the Prime Minister turned again to his old friend, the new Lord Brabazon, and invited him to form an advisory committee of his, of his own. And Winston said, here we are in a situation of crisis or planned opportunity. Let's turn to the second, under the unlikely person of Lord Beaverbrook, who wasn't exactly famous for his planned advice, but nevertheless, great enthusiasm, great energy, and great regard, of course, for, for Winston. And so, a new Brabazon Advisory Committee was set up to consider what might be done about the future of British civil transport aircraft when war conditions might permit. And that started on the 23rd of September, 1942. And it was made wholly 
made up wholly of um, officials of the Ministry of Aircraft Production and the Air Ministry. And there were four of them, only four with Brab. Sir Henry Self, that great chap, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Production, and also on the British Air Commission in Washington for a number of years. Sir Francis Shelmerdine, who was the Director General of Civil Aviation at that time. W.P. Hildred, later Sir William Hildred, Dick Hildred, Director of Civil Aviation, and Nero Rowe, N.E. Rowe, Director of Technical Development at MAP. The Secretary was Kennel T. Spencer, a great chap later on as Chief Scientist of the, of the government, and John Riddock and Beverly Shenston, who I had the good fortune to have as my, as my Chief Engineer later on in BEA, and Jock Gray, Technical Development MAP. And that was the first Brabazon Committee and only four members. And together they sat to consider very carefully drafted terms of reference. Now that's rather crowded, but the terms of reference were to prepare outline specifications of the several aircraft that aircraft types that would be needed for post-war air transport and to suggest which companies should be invited as soon as urgent war work permits to prepare tender designs, and then consider also the possibility of some converted military types for a stopgap, and then to prepare a plan for the immediate utilization in the interests of post-war air transport of spare design and production capacity while the aircraft industry later on is in transition from war to peace. And that was the plan that they were to work to at that time. And Brab being an energetic chap, they got down to it. And um, with those terms of reference, and with the backup of the Ministry of Aircraft Production and the Air Ministry, they came forward on the 9th of February, 43, after 48 days of, of investigation with their recommendations. The adaption for civil use of four types of aircraft which were then in or near production, the Avro York, uh, tremendously noisy and uh, uh, with four Merlins right up against the side of the square box fuselage under the wing, the Vickers Warwick, 14 of them were made over to BOAC, and two flying boats, the Short Hyatt and the Short Sandringham, two different developments of the Short Empire flying boat. And then their main recommendation was that there should be design set in hand for five aeroplanes, a long-range land plane for North Atlantic services, a DC-3 replacement for European services, a medium-range land plane for Empire air routes, as they were then called, an experimental fast mail plane for Empire services, a short-range mail plane, and a 14-passenger feeder liner. And those five types would be set in hand as soon as war would permit. Specifications would be drafted jointly by potential users and aircraft manufacturers, and uh, the MAP and the Air Ministry were asked to cooperate. So there was the start of a long, long trail, which went on from the first Brabazon committee to a second committee. And on the recommendation of Lord Brabazon, the new committee with a total of eight members was drawn from a much wider range of people. Not, the officials were still there in the background to, to um, help when needed, but Brab wanted a much wider lot to consider with a background of air transport. Alan Campbell Ord, who had been one of the first pilots of services between London and transport in the RAF during the peace conference in 1919. Captain Geoffrey de Havilland, the doyen of British aircraft designers. Uh, Group Captain William Helmore, who was uh, assistant, uh, an advisor to the Ministry of Aircraft Production and a famous commentator on uh, Hendon air displays of those days. 
William Hildred, the new Director General of Civil Aviation, Ronald McCrindle, who had also been, who had been Commandant of Number One Communication Squadron in 1919, and had then set up and run the early private British Airways, based at Gatwick, and Major Ronald Thornton, a member of the Air Registration Board, not a porter of Al Alfred Holt, but a partner. I'm afraid in making the slide. <laughs> He did a good deal of portraying too, but anyway, he was a partner. And Air Commodore Wardle, the Director of Operational Requirements, who was an old Royal Flying Corps man, and the same backup of Secretary um, and Advisors with C.B. Collins, Nero Rowe, and K.T. Spencer. A, a formidable lot with a wider grasp of all the problems than perhaps the original uh, committee. Now, Churchill backed all this very strongly and was particularly, of course, concerned that as soon as possible, a comfortable, warm, if possible, pressurized aeroplane might be available for the long sort of flights that he was engaging on, but realizing, of course, it would be some years before it might come about. There was nothing on, it, on the drawing boards in those days. After cancelling the short S-32 in 1939, which had been a pressurized project which was started just before the war at Shorts but then stopped because of war pressures. Instead uh, there were no British aircraft, civil aircraft in prospect at all. So the Prime Minister decided further talking to Brab and to Lord Beaverbrook that something must be done and on the 28th of September, 43, number 10 Drowning Street announced that Lord Beaverbrook was back as Lord Privy Seal to lead the way forward in civil aviation. And as Churchill said, I've asked the Lord Privy Seal to assume responsibility for the coordination of all post-war civil air transport, air transport policy. We shall proceed in steps. First, the aircraft, which will be required for post-war operations, aircraft on which the noble Lord, Lord Brabazon, is working with his colleagues of the Brabazon committees in a careful and practical review. And with the aircraft industry today, our largest industry, with great technical skill and experience, we are confident that it can make a real contribution to the development of civil air transport after the war, and that is our intention. Much of the Brabazon committee's work, he said, must of course be secret. In due course, its report will receive the most careful consideration which it will merit. And at once Lord Beaverbrook, as a real hustler, set things in hand. First he announced a conference of representatives of the Dominions and Colonies, which would be called to plan our future commitment to civil air transport. And secondly, he reaffirmed his complete support and that of the government for Lord Brabazon and his committee in their search for advanced new aircraft types. Now, as it happened, just to put a personal point in, I was at that time on a special assignment in the United States for both the Air Ministry and the United States Air Forces after a stint of flying with the United States 96 Bomb Group and B-17s um, on liaison with the RAF. And I happened to be in Farmingdale, Long Island on the date of the announcement of Beaverbrook's appointment at the Republic Aircraft Factory at uh, Farmingdale, Long Island, looking at the new um, P-47 Thunderbolt fighter, deciding whether it was going to be useful to the RAF. And suddenly, out of the blue, I was handed a cable from Lord Beaverbrook, and it said, require urgent talk, advise date return soonest. So I bustled back, and when I landed at Heston a couple of days later, Lord Beaverbrook was on the phone, and he said, um, I want you to come and work for me. The Prime Minister asked me to look at the future of the whole of British civil aviation in conjunction with both the Americans and Lord Brabazon. I need your help. Come and see me at Gwida House tomorrow. Goodbye to you. And I'd said one word, hello. <laughs> anyway, when I got to Gwida House, number two Whitehall next day, he explained that he'd been invited by the Prime Minister to set up a new War Cabinet Committee on post-war civil air transport. He'd cleared with Archie Sinclair at the Air Ministry that I was to be its secretary and uh, he intended to hold a Commonwealth Conference in the course of the next short while and then go to America to carry the initiative forward to the United States. 
And in all of this, he said, we'll work closely with Lord Brabazon, who will be calling at Widow House tomorrow for an initial talk. Please be there with him. And he tells me that you're in his good books, he said. Let's see what we can do to speed his task, whatever the Air Ministry can may say, because the Air Ministry is a bit doubtful about all the pressure that was being put on civil aeroplanes. Now, Lord Beaverbrook, uh, Lord Brabazon turned up next day at Gwida House in his usual way, courteous, calm, and well-informed. He said his committee were making progress, that there was a shocking dearth of suitable civil aero engines, and they must try to winnow out some interim types which could, could be converted to hold the fort until the new aircraft could be ready. And he said that, as we all knew, the most important requirement is an adequate North Atlantic aeroplane. It's also the most difficult task but there are prospects of converting the latest type of Avro bomber to fill the gap. And so the so-called Empire Conference started on 11th of, of October, and, and the development of the Lancaster IV, which became the Avro Lincoln, was approved at that conference, uh, and was called the Howe, the Howe Balfour aeroplane because C.D. Howe, the Canadian Minister of Defence and Supply, and Harold Balfour, the Secretary of State for Air at the Air Ministry, were both so keen on it. It was agreed as a priority and was one major result of that conference, and so was born the unhappy Tudor. Sadly, surprisingly, an unsatisfactory in its flying, as unsatisfactory in its flying characteristics as its military variant, the Lancaster, was good. That's another story, and I won't have time to go into it today, but it was a very sad thing that the Tudor, on which so much emphasis was placed, just didn't turn out to be a, an aeroplane that could be used effectively. But meanwhile, Lord Beaverbrook and, and I myself with him, now fully involved, had a great deal of discussion and argument about which, with Brab involved, of course, about which of the 16 leading British aircraft constructors should be selected for the new Brabazon types. And after a lot of discussion, six of them were picked on as being suitable for launching off on these new British types. It was airspeed under Arthur Hagg, late of de Havilland's and a great design man. De Havilland, de Havilland aircraft under R.E. Bishop, Miles Aircraft under F, with F.G. Miles, these were their chief designers. Avro under Roy Chadwick, Bristol under Leslie Fries, with Archibald Russell as his assistant, and Vickers under Rex Pearson with George Edwards as his assistant. And those were the six selected aircraft companies to have a go. And in the course of the next few months, the Brabazon Committee um, worked out eight aeroplanes on which uh, efforts should be concentrated. The first was the North Atlantic, the non-stop in all weathers, to succeed as a what was called a blue ribbon aeroplane, what had been the great ocean liners across the Atlantic in pre-war days. And the Bristol 167 had been developed, uh, I'll come to it in a moment, as a a prospect for this uh, as, a, as a development of a bomber which Bristol had had on the drawing boards for a couple of years. Then there was European transport. Airspeed under Hag had a what was first called a DC-3 replacement but grew and I'm sure rightly to be a much bigger aeroplane instead of a 21-seater went became eventually a 47-seater and Hag produced a, a brilliant aeroplane in the Ambassador, high-wing, twin-engined, Bristol Centaurus engines, which worked out extremely well, which we found excellent in BEA, but later on. Then, the first of the revolutionary, what were called revolutionary in those days, the first of the turboprops, the little Vickers V630, VC10, originally called the Viceroy, but because India then was disappearing out of the British map, it was called the Viscount after that, and um, was a genuine VC, uh, DC-3 replacement in its first concept, but also was grown, rightly, 
an airplane which sadly was a, a disappointment, the Apollo, because it had axial flow engines um, instead of the uh, rough and ready, in a way, uh, centrifugal type darts in the VC2, which really made it a great success. And then Avro were given the task of the long range Empire airplane. The Avro 693, which because of the Tudor problems and the fact that Avro got bogged down on early tailless airplanes uh, and fully swept wings, sadly the Avro 693 never got built. And I, I'm s sorry because I think Chadwick would have produced a very good airplane. Uh, then a medium range empire was brought into the picture and Bristol came into it with later on, much later on, the Bristol 175. A high speed mail plane was the next Brabazon requirement and there's a long story of how that came about and at one stage it was a twin boom aeroplane of relatively small size and we'll see that a bit later on. Then there was, and that came, developed into of course the, the DH Comet, you go back on that, the DH Comet in its early stages. Miles were asked to produce a 14 seat feeder lined aeroplane and DH, the Dove, as a replacement for the DH-89 Rapide, which had was a jolly good aeroplane before the war, but was now getting a bit outdated. And then Beaverbrook went on to say, we've got to go to America, find out what's going on there, and see what we can do to bring Britain into the whole picture. So I was able to, knowing George Brackley, of, or later Imperial Airways, who was then uh, leading Transport Command, I managed to get hold of Marco Polo, the special long-range liberator, which Lord Mountbatten had used for the flying to the Far East. And we tanked it up and, talking to, to the beaver, decided that we might make a, a splash by going to the United States by making the first non-stop flight from capital to capital, from London to Washington. And so we took off on the 20th of July, 1943, and there you see the team that went. There was um, Ralph Ashton of the uh, Treasury, there was the Beaver himself, there was Sir William Brown, Secretary of the Air Ministry, there was Geoffrey Lloyd, Minister of Petroleum, and two, and um, George Malcolm Thompson, Beaver's private secretary, and myself. And we sat or set off and from North Holt, just scraped out with all the fuel, nearly collected a London bus on the way past the Western Avenue, and 19 hours and 40 minutes later, landed with half an hour's fuel left at Washington National. But we had quite a useful meeting there. But the thing that came from it was the fact that a full international conference would be held in, in Montreal to be on reasonably neutral ground as soon as possible with 52 nations to decide the future of post-war air transport and in fact set up ICAO, ICAO and that um, we were able also to find out pretty well what was going on in the United States in the way of new transport airplanes and Beaverbrook wrote a, a a message to the cabinet saying we really have got to get moving because we're going to be frozen out of this air transport business unless we really do something pretty fast. And um, this um, cable from Washington, the first words were, there's no time to lose, this was to the Prime Minister, if we are to have a place for Britain in future air transport. I'm convinced that our only chance is to equip ourselves with new and efficient British aircraft at the earliest possible moment. Converted bombers will not do. And he ended it, arise, O Israel, get going. <laughs> and I passed that on to Lord Brabazon, and he said, of course, I heartily agree. Well, when we got back, 
non-stop to Northolt, this time from LaGuardia, in the single tail Liberator Commando, which on the next, sh next flight across the Atlantic disappeared with all hands, including leading members of the Air Ministry. It's thought that the single fin and rudder came off. So we, that party there, barely escaped. Of course, the next flight, everyone perished in the aeroplane. But meanwhile, back here at the Royal Aeronautical Society, the ministers committee, working closely with the Brabazon Committee and the War Cabinet Committee was in play, and it's just interesting to see it, under now Stafford Cripps, who was Minister of War Production, of Aircraft Production, Stafford Cripps there, Roy Fenton there, Sidney Cam, Darrow Rex Pearson, tiring over everyone else, uh, Atchison and um, Charles Walker of the Havilands, Sir Rafe Sawley of the Air Ministry, Lawrence Pritchard and and gouge of shorts. And they were working away, hand in glove with the Brabson Committee and our War Cabinet Committee as well. So things were bu buzzing and airplanes were being sought. And in fact, those earlier types that had been discussed flew in this following order. It was a hectic time and the first one to fly was the Dove, the simplest one first of course, on the 25th of September 1945. Then came the Marathon, which was sadly not a success. It had control troubles and structural troubles. So it was one of the failures of the, the Brabazon Committee. Um, third one was the Airspeed Ambassador, about which I'll say more in a moment. Um, then came the first little Vickers Viscount, the 24-seater against the 40-seater, 47-seater ambassador. That was the last of the piston engines and, and this was the first of the turboprops. Apollo, which was a failure because of the complexity of the Mamba engines with the actual, actual um, compressors. And um, of course they were a success in the end, but they were too early then. Then the Comet, First flew in 49, and the most complicated of the lot, the Brabazon, in September 49, and the Britannia, which was really a, a make-do to replace the Avro 693, which didn't appear, couldn't be done, uh, a good deal later than the others. So there the aeroplanes were beginning to appear. And let's just quick, quickly look with just a few minutes left at what they were. The first one was one of those interim types that uh, the Brabazon Committee had been asked to consider and which Vickers, Rex Pearson and George Edwards brought along as a straight um, DC-3 replacement, two Hercules engines and a, a stress skin fuselage compared with the geodetics of the Wellington uh, it was the same size as the Wellington, but uh, more advanced and starting off as 24 seats and was stretched eventually to 27 seats. Now that did a good job for us in BEA. When I went later on as chief executive of BEA, we had 80 of them in the end, 80 of them as well as 63 DC-3s. And they really started BEA going but were totally uneconomic, and we lost a good deal of money in the early days. But the idea was to get air transport moving rather than to make money at that time. So that was the first. Now the second one to fly was the DH Dove, and that flew 50 years ago almost to today, 25th of September, 1945. And um, the Dove, of course, was in one way the most successful of the Brabazon types because it, 456 of them were built, Doves and Devons, the military version, a nice little airplane, slightly held back by the fact that it had got these rather ancient uh, gypsy engines. If it had had the more modern American uh, flat sixes, it would have much lighter and more powerful, it would have done better. But nevertheless, it did jolly well and um, 
it's nice to know that there are still six doves on the British Civil Register today with full C of A's. And I did quite a bit of flying in the doves and enjoyed it very much because it was such a nice aeroplane to fly and very sturdy and reliable. Then came the, the Bristol Freighter, it was a private venture aeroplane, also as one of these interim types, Bristol 170. Um, I was in Washington when the first of them being uh, on a demonstrated tour hove in sight at Washington National Airport. I happened to be in the control tower at the time and the controller said over the radio, say, what type of airplane is that? And um, uh, the, the Bristol uh, test pilot said, this is a new Bristol freighter. Say, he said, make it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but even if it looked a bit crude, it did a jolly good job. And of course, it was an excellent way of crossing the channel with its clam opening doors in front. And some of the nice cha best channel crossings I've ever had was in the Bristol freighter with three cars, one in front of the other. But that was an interim type. Then came the Marathon, which as I've said, was not a success. Four engines, not very modern engines, crammed into that little airplane were totally uneconomic. And it had structural problems as well, and Miles aircraft had problems. So that didn't proceed. 20 of them were in fact built, and the RAF op operated some of them for a bit, but it wasn't a success. And then this beautiful airplane, the airspeed ambassador, which we called the Elizabethan class in BEA because we got it into service when the Queen's coronation first came. And um, a delightful airplane, very nice to fly. Two Bristol Centaurus engines, which proved not only quiet, but, but reliable. And uh, it did us very well until it got superseded by the turboprops. But with 47 passengers, it was economic, and we even made money with it. And um, it had a range to be able to fly nonstop to Rome with 40 passengers. So that was one of the Brabazon successes. But the great success, of course, was the Vickers Viscount. Here's the little V630, 24-seater, a genuine um, DC-3 replacement, but too small. We quickly saw it was too small. And uh, George Edwards and I got together and decided we must have a bigger version. And I was delighted uh, 18 months later to be able to sign a, uh, an order for 20 of the stretched Viscounts um, with 47 passengers, which made it much more economic. But it did fly the world's first turbine-powered, one has to say that deliberately, turbine-powered commercial service from London to London North Holt to Paris Le Bourget. And there's some of the VIP crew uh, passengers. We also had 14 fare-paying passengers as well as those. And left to right there, oh, it was quite an interesting collection. Um, Alfred Lamplew, who chaired the Lamplew Committee, which was one of the predecessors to the, Blank to the Brabazon Committee, chief surveyor of Lloyd's and of the British, insur British Aviation Insurance, and a great chap and supporter of British Aviation, as well as a member of the ARB. Then George Edwards, of course, who designed this aeroplane, and one of the great characters who I was talking to on the telephone yesterday, and he said, would I send all his good wishes to everyone here? I'm sorry that he wasn't well enough to be with you. Next to him, Frank Whittle, who came on that first flight, saying it's wrong to put propellers on the front of my beautiful jet engines, but I'm delighted to be there anyway. Uh, Arnold Overton, the, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Civil Aviation, who succeeded that other great man, uh, Sir Henry Self. Tony Millwood, who was my successor later on at BEA as chief executive. Jimmy James, our chief pilot of BEA. And uh, Corriton, the head of the um, engine side of the Ministry of Aircraft Production. And, uh, and myself there. And that was our 
VIP lot on the world's first turbine-powered commercial air service to Paris, and the, um, the little prototype Viscount went on to fly a month to Paris and then a month to the Ed Edinburgh Festival and charmed everybody with its quietness and its lack of vibration. And um, it really was a jolly good aeroplane. In fact, the smaller uh, dart engines were quieter and less vibration than the developed ones later on. Alongside the, um, the Viscount came the Apollo from Armstrong Whitworth with these axial flow member engines. That's a painting of it. And it wasn't a success because of the, of the mambas. And um, the, later on, of course, the axials were the right answer. But at that stage, they were too complicated. And then came the problem of getting into the jet business. And the Havilands had made a success of flying this single-seat fighter, the, the Havilland Vampire. There you see the Vampire with a Goblin engine. Nice little airplane to fly. I, I flew flew it once and found it very easy, no problem at all. And it gave de Havilland's the idea that they ought to get into the jet transport business. So they decided they'd be revolutionary and have a three goblins, 3,000 3, pound static thrust engines, grouped in the tail, as you see there. And they were, they were there, three of them at the back, and a, a tailless aeroplane, not very elegant, uh, which um, was a mail plane initially, and then stretched a bit to be a 20-passenger aeroplane. You see, it's going, it's going this way with a four-plane. And that was the first attempt at a, a jet transport aeroplane. But nobody was very keen on it, though de Havilland's built the 108, the Havilland DH-108 tailless aeroplane, as you see here, which um, was really a, a test aeroplane for the possible tailless transport aeroplane, which initially, even then, was beginning to be called the Comet. And he, Jeffrey, young Jeffrey de Havilland, uh, old Jeffrey's son, who you see there, made the first flight in May of 1950. Three, and here's after that first flight. Um, there's Jeffrey having landed, and um, there's um, Frank Holford and um, Bishop discussing that first flight, which was very successful. In fact, so successful that they decided to go for a world speed record, just supersonic. And sadly, the aircraft broke up in the air when it went supersonic, and that splendid chap, young Geoffrey de Havilland, was killed. And this was a very sad start to this particular problem. But um, de Havilland's, as ever, pressed on, and uh, the next thing was a lunch at de Havilland's when we discussed where we should go from there. And it's interesting to see a collection around the table there, um, an, an informal lunch to talk. Martin Sharp, the excellent uh, PR chap of, of de Havilland's, who wrote that, who produced de Havilland Gazette, a splendid works paper. Uh, John Brodie, the first-rate uh, engine man from de Havilland's. There was Bishop there, I think, myself. Uh, I, think, I, I think that's... Um, I can't quite see there, but there was Clarkson. I know that uh, Mike Ramsden's here and can perhaps recognize them all. Nixon there, I think, and some Bob there. Anyway, it was a, a consultation lunch to decide where to go. And where it went was the DH-106 <coughs> as the first comet. And that little airplane there, 34-seater, was the uh, Brabazon Type 4 in the, in the flesh. And everyone was delighted with it, with four ghost engines. And it did absolutely splendidly, but it 
was on the frontiers of knowledge, as you know. Sadly, it had structural failures shortly after it had gone into service. Uh, the square windows were one of the problems. Of pressurization was quite new in those days, and nobody was quite certain what the problems would be in metal fatigue. And also, though it hasn't ever really been fully uh, mentioned, there was a problem of redux. The, the um, fuselage was assembled with redux uh, molding, and uh, that went as well as the windows. And there was those structural failures. The setback was sad because the comet was leading the world in its day, um, and it put it back some years. But with great courage, great expense, the comet was redone, stretched, went into good service, and we had 14 of them in BEA, and they did well on our short haul routes. And with BOAC, it was the first non-stop Atlantic jet airplane. Not non-stop all the way to New York, but non-stop as far as um, Bruce and Gander. And, of course, at 500 miles an hour, was in advance of anything else until the Boeing 707 came along. And there's no doubt that Boeing learnt a lot from the sad comet story. But the Brabazon Type 4 was in front of the world in that step, in that step forward with de Havilland. Well then, we come finally in the list of those airplanes to the Brabazon 1, the great trans-Atlantic airplane, which was to take 100 passengers non-stop across the Atlantic both ways um, against even an 80 mile an hour wind. And the first concept of the Brabazon was with pusher propellers, uh, coupled Centaurus engines, eight of them, coupled in the wing with pushers behind and a butterfly tail. But this ginormous wing, which was bigger than the 550, 5,500 square feet of wing area, bigger than the, or at least as big as the wing of the um, uh, 747 today, and 230 feet span against 95 foot span of the 747. So it was a much too big a wing. And this really was the Great Eastern in the air, equivalent to the Great Eastern steamship way ahead of its day on the, in the ocean liner field. But nevertheless, pressing on and altering the fuselage, uh, altering the wing to have um, tractor geared propellers, but still very complicated because um, there were two Centaurus at an angle in the wing here, um, driving through shafts, and um, a very complicated thing, which really was the ruin of it in the end because fatigue failures occurred in the engine mountings, which was a pity because I suggested to Bristol that we should be loaned in BEA the first this particular aeroplane for the summer peak season from uh, Heathrow to Nice in 1952 and um, really show what a, a really big aeroplane could do when we needed even six by counts to carry the traffic at midday between London and Nice in those days. But unfortunately these fatigue problems prevented that happening. But this photograph is of 15th of May, I think, 1950, when the Brabazon came to, to um, Heathrow for demonstration flying and showing with 20 seats put inside that vast fuselage, 18 feet diameter, which compares with the 21 foot diameter of the 747 today. So it was virtually that size, but a, a very elegant um, size of, of fuselage. And there's that day, I think I'm in the picture somewhere there, the MPs, the Brabazon Committee, and the um, War Tran <coughs> the Ministry of War Transport Committee as well, all taken for a ride in this delightful aeroplane. Um, very s steady, very quiet, very commodious, but unfortunately not up to the requirements structurally of those days. So that was the last of the Brabazon aeroplanes. But just to finish, and I must, 
Then came the Britannia, which was an afterthought on the Brabson Type 3, did well, got delayed again by the introductory problems of turboprop engines, the Proteus engines there, which uh, had frightful icing problems with a reverse flow in the, in the engines. Uh, air went in there and round and back and iced around the bend. In fact, the solution was called the Harpic solution, clean round the bend. But um, it, it was, took two years to solve and that delayed the, this, very, this beautiful Britannia uh, to miss the boat compared with the first seven, 707 jets and then the later comets. We flew it, made the first non-stop flight from Heathrow to the Pacific coast of the United States in the Britannia to deliver to uh, Canadian Pacific Air Airways. In 17 hours it took us and uh, we were very pleased at the time. Uh, a good aeroplane, 82 were built. There would have been 182 if it hadn't been so long delayed, but it made, made um, money for BOAC during the limited time before the jets made it obsolete. Now, just to finish, Brab was a charming man, one of the best ever, I think. And at the time when uh, he was president of the Royal Aero Club and I was chairman, we had some very interesting times together. He flew with me in, in very small airplanes on a number of occasions, but he wasn't keen on it. And I flew him one day to Jersey in a small airplane and he insisted taking his shoes off before we took off. He said, because I swim so much better without my <laughs> shoes. And there is Brab who had so many sides to his character, was the uh, um, captain of the Royal and Ancient at uh, St. Andrews, an enormously keen golfer. Of course, uh, a St. Moritz uh, dab hand on the St. Moritz um, crest to run. And always, again, as you see, with a, a cigarette in a holder in his mouth. And a delightful chap. And I think that the work he did on the Brabson Committee, holding together some quite disparate types and masterminding it always with courtesy, calmness and enthusiasm, was a thing which the British aircraft industry still owes a great deal because some of the, those working in the industry still today owe the fact that they had their start to make Brabson aeroplanes. And then last of all, just a personal reminiscence, of Lord Douglas, the um, immediate past president of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and his younger brother, Charles there, uh, going aboard that very first V630 B6, Viscount on that first turbine-powered uh, commercial air service, which is something, I think, to have in your personal logbook. Good chap was Lord Douglas. He and I worked very happily together for five years and brought BEA into profit with the Brabazon airplanes. The first time any British airline had made a genuine profit and we were very pleased to be able to do it with British airplanes uh, out of the Brabazon stable. And I've overrun a bit, forgive me for that, but it's nice to be able to look back on on the whole, a record of success of a great, uh, a great experiment in the days when war was still around us and we were looking to the future and hoping that we might be able to work it out, but quite uncertain whether it would come about or not. On the whole, I think it did a job and it was a great privilege and pre pleasure to be associated with it and especially with people such as Brab, such as Beaverbrook and such as Shorto Douglas as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>